a pleasure to welcome you to our first webinar. And uh, hopefully this will be the first of many webinars, uh, assuming all goes well and uh, it's a success. We'd like to do this on a regular basis from here on out. Uh, before we get started, there are a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, items that I have to ra raise, um, having to do with uh, the webinar itself. The first thing is you can expand the, uh, the video box. My understanding is you take the mouse to the corner of the box and click it, uh, you'll be able to, to expand it to make the, the video larger. And also there's a, a chat box in the lower left-hand corner of the screen where you can enter, enter your questions. Um, the way that we're going to do this today is, since this is our very first webinar, I'd like to take an opportunity at the beginning to talk about the School of Science and Engineering, uh, how it came about, uh, what the status of the school is now, and where I envision the, the school going in, in, the, uh, in the future. Uh, then we'll open it up to questions. We've already received a number of questions, so I'll address those questions first, uh, and then you'll have the opportunity to type in your questions, and I will get to as many questions as I can within the hour. Uh, if your question is unanswered during this hour, uh, I will uh, uh, email it to me, and if you email it to me, I'll be happy to respond. My email address is simply altiero, A-L-T-I-E-R-O, at Tulane.edu. So with that, I'd like to take a few minutes here, just a little bit of a presentation, to talk about the School of Science and Engineering, especially for those of you who may not know how we've gotten to where we are and what, uh, what our plans are going forward. So I'd like to start with uh, my first slide. Uh, and the first slide has, has, goes back to Hurricane Katrina. Uh, I bring up Hurricane Katrina because obviously that was the, uh, the change point uh, when the School of Science and Engineering was introduced at Tulane University. So a few things about the storm. First off, uh, as you know, uh, the entire downtown health sciences campus of Tulane University uh, was underwater. That includes the medical school, the School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. All of those facilities were flooded. Uh, the uptown campus, 70% of the uptown campus was flooded. Uh, that would be everything from Perret Street north was all, uh, was all uh, damaged by flooding. And the south part, south of Perret Street, uh, suffered significant uh, wind damage. Overall, 13,000 students were displaced and 8,000 faculty and staff were, were displaced and the university was forced to close for the fall semester of 2005. Uh, the university's IT and communication systems were totally disabled. Telephone service was lost throughout the entire 504 area code. Uh, it turns out the university sustained over $650 million in losses. And the projections at the time going forward were that it was going to run an annual deficit of $30 million thereafter. So it was a very devastating storm and the university had a, a suffered a, a severe setback. At the time of the storm, the board met in Houston to discuss the future of Tulane University. And at that meeting, it was decided that the university would not close, that it would, would open again, that it would open in January, and that a plan would be put forth to make the university not only come back from Hurricane Katrina, but come back bigger and better than ever before. Before I talk a little bit about that plan, let me explain who the competition is. And so the next slide lists a number of universities. There are 4,500 universities in the United States, and all of those universities have, they all have their, their, their missions. Uh, there are Carnegie classifications of the universities classify about 200 of them as research universities, perhaps about 100 of them as highly uh, intensive research universities, and another 100 as not quite as intensive research universities. Tulane is one of those 100 uh, very intense research universities. Furthermore, Tulane is one of 60 American AAU universities. The AAU is uh, without doubt the most distinguished group of universities in the country, and it consists of 60 of the top research universities in the country, and Tulane is, is one of those universities. Of those, uh, the, the ones you see on the, on the screen are the private institutions. So these are the institutions that Tulane competes with. Uh, these are the institutions that our students apply to in addition to applying to Tulane. These are the institutions against which we measure our, our success. While all of these universities have outstanding undergraduate programs, they also are very research active universities and have very active doctoral programs. So there are a number of metrics 
it qualifies you to be an AAU university, and Tulane is one of those. So when the board was looking at the plan for the future, not only did they want to um, assure that Tulane would survive Hurricane Katrina and come back, but also that Tulane would come back um, as, as robust as before, even more robust than before, and continue to be competitive among this very distinguished uh, group of universities. The next slide talks about the plan for renewal. The plan for renewal was issued in December uh, 2005. Uh, you can still see the plan on the web if you care to, to, to look at what, uh, what, what the tenets of that plan are. Uh, see, the plan was a plan to ensure the continuing academic ascendancy and financial health of Tulane University. So financial health was important, but also the importance was, a great deal of importance was placed on the university, not only uh, surviving at the level of excellence that had before Katrina, but continuing to grow. Uh, at the center will be an exceptional undergraduate program that is campus and student-centric and dedicated to the holistic development of students. This is Newcomb Tulane College. So Tulane University now has one undergraduate college, that's Newcomb Tulane College. All of our undergraduate students enroll in Newcomb Tulane College, and then they can major or minor or double major uh, whatever they want to do in all of the schools, but their home, academic home, is actually in Newcomb Tulane College. This will be surrounded and strengthened by a limited number of graduate, professional, and research programs that build on the university's historical strengths and distinctive characteristics. There are nine schools at Tulane University now. The School of Science and Engineering is one of those nine schools. Each of the nine schools has its mission, and all of those missions fit with the mission of the institution as a whole. Uh, as appropriate, Tulane's programs will be shaped by the university's direct experience with the unprecedented natural disaster of Hurricane Katrina, providing research, learning, and community service opportunities that will have a long-lasting and profound effect. The next slide shows a specific excerpt from the renewal plan having to do with the establishment of the School of Science and Engineering. <clears throat> The excerpt is as follows. The School of Science and Engineering will combine the former LAS science departments, that's liberal arts and sciences, uh, the science departments with the remaining engineering departments to create a new school with five distinct divisions. The university will begin a planning process this spring, led by Dean Nicholas Altiero, to de define a new vision for engineering within the context of the School of Science and Engineering, and to also build a strong foundation from which Tulane can strategically grow its science and engineering presence in the future. The involvement of alumni in this process will be critical to its success. Uh, by way of background, uh, there were five engineering departments before Hurricane Katrina. Uh, three of those engineering departments were eliminated, leaving only biomedical engineering and chemical engineering. I won't go into the details surrounding the elimination of the three departments because I anticipate there will be questions about that and I can address that then. But the two departments that did survive are very strong departments with not only a very strong undergraduate tradition, but very strong research uh, uh, funding levels, as well as uh, large doctoral programs. The science departments from LAS um, were, were all moved into the School of Science and Engineering, and there was a School of Liberal Arts created uh, with the Liberal Arts programs. Uh, this talks about five divisions. It turns out there are now six, because the uh, Department of Psychology, which originally was envisioned to be in the School of Liberal Arts, was later moved to the School of Science and Engineering. And I'll talk about those six divisions here in a minute. So we indeed did uh, put together a strategic plan back in 2006 to 2007, and by July 1st of 2007, we're prepared to uh, initiate the School of Science and Engineering at Tulane University. Um, the next slide shows what we uh, listed as the, 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 the points that we would emphasize in achieving the strategic vision for the new school. And I believe these are very important points to, uh, to emphasize. Um, to achieve the vision, the School of Science and Engineering must position itself for a leadership role in a world where science and engineering are increasingly interconnected. Provide students with a broad educational experience and a deep understanding of science and its applications and impact have departments of sufficient size and critical mass to be competitive for international recognition of their academic programs and their research impact. 
have strong interdisciplinary ties among the departments of the school and with partners throughout the university and beyond, promote a climate of cultural diversity and global awareness, and be, and be responsive to the needs of the community. So these points are quite important in everything I have to say here and really uh, are, are the underlying principles upon which the school is founded. The next slide is what I believe is the result of the strategic plan and the nine years that have followed the strategic plan. The Tulane University School of Science and Engineering has pioneered a new model for integrated science and engineering education and research. Although most major research universities offer programs in both science and engineering, few have been able to integrate them meaningfully. The School of Science and Engineering is a school in which science and engineering are tightly interconnected, where scientists and engineers work together in an integrated organization on problems of mutual interest, where current research in engineering is informed by current research in science, and vice versa, and where students, regardless of their major field of study, have the opportunity to be exposed to concepts and methods of both science and engineering. Many universities in the country are indeed bringing science and engineering closer together. Uh, scientific breakthroughs of the last 20, 30 years are, are, are revolutionizing uh, uh, engineering. Breakthroughs in, genetic, uh, in genetics, molecular biology, nanoscience, uh, information technology, these are uh, accelerating engineering innovation at a feverish pace. And I think that we, as a, to be competitive globally, have to continue to build the uh, engineering innovations on the very latest scientific discoveries. And so bringing science and engineering very close together is, is a goal of every, uni every university in this country. Many universities now have indeed integrated the physical sciences with engineering into single colleges or schools. That's become very common. A smaller number have included the biological sciences, although there's an effort to grow that as well. We've done both. And in addition to that, we've included the behavioral sciences. And with the increasing emphasis on the brain, on research involving the brain, I think we've positioned ourselves extremely well with the inclusion of psychology in the School of Science and Engineering. The next slide shows the cornerstones of our school's mission. We established this early on that we as a school would focus on these four things and the intersection among these four things. Of course, undergraduate education goes without saying. Uh, we, have a, we have a very large undergraduate program here at Tulane University, very strong, very competitive, uh, top-rate students, and we will continue to put a great deal of emphasis on the undergraduate experience. As I said earlier, we are a Research One university. We're an AAU university. Research and graduate education has to be a critical facet of what we do. And in the School of Science and Engineering, it is a key cornerstone of our school. Um, I also, on this diagram, this is, this is my version of a Venn diagram. The edges are squared off, but it is a Venn diagram. And so looking at the intersections is also very, very important. And in the School of Science and Engineering, about 250 or more of our undergraduate students are currently working on research projects. So a lot goes on at the interfaces among these different uh, cornerstones of our mission. The other two cornerstones are the basis of our outreach to the community, uh, K-12 STEM education, that's uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, that's the pipeline. We do a lot of work in the community and in the region uh, to help inspire students to go into the sciences and engineering and to help prepare them to be successful when they do that. And the other area is technology transfer and commercialization. The School of Science and Engineering uh, has become a, a, a place where not only do we publish papers, but we also have a number of patents, licenses, startup companies. We've become very entrepreneurial. And as I said, these are the four cornerstones of our mission. I'd be happy to answer any questions about any of those or the intersection among them. On the next slide, this, talk, this speaks to the success of the School of Science and Engineering. As I said earlier, there are nine schools now at Tulane University. Uh, if you look at the undergraduate population at the university, over 90% of the undergraduate students who are enrolled in Newcomb Tulane College are enrolled in programs in three of those schools, the School of Liberal Arts, the School of Science and Engineering, and the School of Business. The School of Science and Engineering is currently the second largest undergraduate school at Tulane University. In doctoral education, 
Over 90% of the doctoral students at, at Tulane are enrolled in four schools, the School of Science and Engineering, the School of Liberal Arts, the School of Public Health, and the School of Medicine. The School of Science and Engineering ranks number one. We have the largest number of doctoral students at Tulane University. And in funded research, over 90% of externally funded research at Tulane University is attributable to three schools, the School of Medicine, the School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, and the School of Science and Engineering. We're third only to the health sciences in funded research. Uh, the, current, uh, the current snapshot of the school is shown on the next slide. Uh, currently, the full-time undergraduate enrollment in the School of Science and Engineering is 1,750. For those out of you out there that are wondering about the engineering component of the school, uh, about 300 of those undergraduate students are enrolled in our, our uh, engineering programs. At the master's level, we have about 130 students at this point, 20 of whom are enrolled in engineering programs, and we have 350 doctoral students, uh, 70 of whom are enrolled in engineering programs. So we have over 2,200 students in the School of Science and Engineering, and that is a significant increase since Hurricane Katrina, an increase of over 30 percent in the enrollment of science and engineering students at Tulane. In terms of the faculty, we have 120 faculty members in the tenure stream. That would be tenure or tenure track faculty. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with university faculty, uh, tenured faculty are, are uh, do research, teaching, and service. They have a, a threefold mission. We have 120 of those faculty members. About 25 of those are affiliated with engineering programs. We also have 30 faculty members dedicated to teaching. We call uh, the title is Professors of Practice. Okay, we've hired 30 of those. We have 15 faculty members who are dedicated entirely to research and who are funded on uh, solely on research grants, which brings us to a total faculty of about 165 at this point. We do over $20 million a year in annual sponsored programs, research projects. Over the last three years, 50 patents have been filed based on technologies on, uh, on, on SSE faculty and students, and 12 licenses have been executed in the last three years. Uh, uh, Ten startup companies have come out of the School of Science and Engineering based on science and engineering intellectual property. So that's a snapshot of the school. I have one more slide, and the next slide shows our academic programs. This is kind of a busy slide, but it does show that the degree programs that we offer and some of the ones that we're envisioning. You'll see that I've broken it up into six divisions here. These six divisions were the ones named in the uh, renewal plan, although I don't, I don't like the word division for an integrated school, but uh, for a want of a better word. Uh, the divisions are the behavioral, the biological, chemical, geological, mathematical, and physical. And what I've done is I've taken our degree programs and I've categorized them into each of those, those uh, buckets. And what you can see there are we have some very, very strong science programs, and I want to continue to emphasize that while we are building engineering uh, at Tulane University, it is critically important that we continue to build our strength in the sciences as well, because the sciences are very strong here. They will continue to get stronger, and the whole concept of the School of Science and Engineering is to, base strong, is to build strong engineering programs based on very, very strong science programs. So the science programs are all listed in here, but I will draw attention to uh, some of the engineering programs, because I know that that's a concern to a lot of viewers. Um, biomedical engineering and chemical engineering uh, are ABET accredited engineering programs. They were ABET accredited before Katrina. They never lost ABET accreditation. They are stronger now than ever before, in my view. The enrollment is at record high in both, and they're doing extremely well. We have added a third engineering program, engineering physics. It is also an ABET accredited engineering program. So we have, and the enrollment is quite healthy in that program as well. So we now have three ABET accredited engineering programs, and those programs have been accredited uh, through 2020. So they've been accredited for the full length that, uh, of accreditation that, that you could obtain in the accreditation visit. Uh, we are working on, uh, we've also, by the way, we've also introduced a computer science department now at Tulane University. And computer science has introduced a coordinate major, 
What a coordinate major is, it's, it's a major, but it must be a double major. So the student must double major in something and computer science. Um, part of that degree requirement is that when the student does their capstone project, which is a new controlling college requirement, the capstone project must couple their other major to the computer science major. Currently, computer science is looking at the development of a PhD program because we brought in a lot of excellent faculty members. We want to make sure that they have a good research home here as well. Uh, and we're also working on a material science and engineering doctoral program that is being, uh, the, 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 the folks working on this are in the Department of Engineering, of the Physics and Engineering Physics, but they're working to develop a program across multiple departments in, in that area. Um, we're also looking at the interface of the geological sciences and engineering for a potential program or programs. And ultimately, we're going, to, we're going to be looking at the interface between behavioral sciences, the cognitive sciences, and engineering, uh, because that's the, uh, the structure of our school and uh, the, the, the philosophy behind the School of Science and Engineering. That was a very quick uh, overview of how things happen, how they've evolved, and where we are. I'd like to really turn it into a Q&A at this point. As I said, a number of questions have come in. I'll address those uh, as they have come in. And when, I, when we're through those, hopefully those of you out there will be typing in more questions, and I will get to as many as I possibly can uh, during this hour. Okay, so the first question that, is, that, I, that has come in is, for students entering the workforce, how does Tulane assist them in finding employment? Well, of course, that's, that's that's a topic that is on everybody's minds nowadays, is the value of a college education. And one of the things a college of education, a college education does, of course, is prepare you for, for life after college education. Um, Tulane students go into all sorts of different walks of life after they graduate. A lot of our students go on to graduate or professional school and do quite well. They have a very good track record um, in medical school, business school, law school, and of course the uh, graduate programs in science and engineering. Um, and a lot of our students go into public service. They'll go into the Peace Corps, Teach for America, et cetera. Uh, a number of our students are entrepreneurs. We're seeing more and more of them going off and starting their own, their own businesses. But still a significant number of our students are looking for employment in industry, in, in the business sector. And Tulane has an outstanding career services center. The career services department uh, works with students from their freshman year, not only on finding jobs or finding internships, but also on interviews, uh, resume pre preparation, et cetera. In addition, the School of Science and Engineering has gotten very involved with new Tulane College in a lot of different programs for our students. We've involved a lot of our alumni. A lot of you listening in on this are probably part of that program, where we've had panels, where we've had, had uh, uh, alumni and students uh, talking, uh, having having uh, sessions on campus where they'll they call it uh, uh, speed career searches. I, I say speed gating. It's some version of that. Uh, so we do we do a lot of things, and I think that uh, our students, uh, to the best of my knowledge, our students are doing very well in finding employment. Uh, the next question is. Uh, what is the role of the student advisor for engineering majors? Okay, so as I said earlier, all students at Tulane University are Newcomb Tulane College students, so they're all assigned an advisor in Newcomb Tulane College. So every student has, it, and these advisors are, are very, very good. There are, there are advisors in, in Newcomb Tulane College who are specifically assigned to students in science and engineering. So those would be the advisors that have special knowledge of science and engineering, engineering programs. Uh, in addition, once a student chooses a major, they're assigned a faculty advisor. And so every student has two advisors, a Newcomb Tulane College advisor and a faculty advisor in their major discipline. And between the two of them, they can provide the student with advice on course selection, organization of their, of their schedules, uh, career opportunities, uh, and that sort of thing. So it's a very comprehensive program. What is Flower Hall currently used for? So for those of you unaware of Flower Hall, uh, a year or two ago, uh, we tore down the old Taylor Lab building and replaced it with a brand new facility. 
Flower Hall for Research and Innovation. It's a very nice building. It's four stories tall, and it sits right between uh, Lindy Boggs and the, the building formerly known as Mechanical Engineering. And uh, the building, as I said, it's four stories tall. When we built the building, the whole idea was that it would have two floors of shell space. So the first floor and the fourth floor would be built out, and the second and third floors would be space where we could grow into the future. So the first and fourth floors are built out. They're completely occupied. On the first floor, we have the Taylor Laboratory, which replaced the old Taylor Lab building. It's an undergraduate laboratory. Uh, we also have some uh, research laboratories and some office space on the first floor and a lobby. The fourth floor is all research space, several state-of-the-art research labs, except for the front, which is a beautiful uh, conference room overlooking the, uh, a live oak tree. It's a very, very nice place for meetings and for students to study, etc. cetera. Uh, the building was, was always intended for chemical engineering and chemistry. It replaced a chemical engineering building, the Taylor Lab, and it was meant to be a building where research would be done at the, uh, not only research for publication purposes, but also uh, 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 technology transfer at the interface of chemistry and chemical engineering. And so we've got some very, uh, very strong faculty members assigned to that space. Right now, the second floor is being temporarily used by the uh, new Institute for Social Innovation and Design Thinking. That was in the news just yesterday, I believe. A, a large gift from Phyllis Taylor to establish this institute. I've loaned them the second floor of Flower Hall for now until uh, they can establish a permanent location. We're working on that as well. Uh, the, the second floor and the third floor are both built for labs. They have a tremendous foot capacity, and we intend to, to build out more labs. Uh, I'm going to start work very soon on building out the third floor for two of our faculty members, one in chemical engineering and one in chemistry. And uh, the second floor is still uh, shell space for future use. Next question is, why is psychology part of SFD and not SLA? Well, we, let me tell you the real answer and then just tell you uh, the, the, the net result. Uh, at, when the renewal plan was formulated, psych, psychology was actually placed in the School of Liberal Arts. Um, the psychology faculty met shortly after that. And they decided that, that they were going to offer only the Bachelor of Science degree. Psychology is a science, that the degree is a Bachelor of Science, that it is very quantitative, and that it belonged in the School of Science and Engineering. So they basically asked that it be moved from the School of Liberal Arts to the School of Science and Engineering, uh, which it was immediately moved into the School of Science and Engineering. So right from the very start, it was part of our strategic planning process. I can tell you that that's worked out beautifully. The, uh, the, the faculty members in the Department of Psychology, a number of them are neuroscientists. They work very closely with uh, neuroscientists in cell and molecular biology, neuroscientists in the downtown campus at the, the health, in, in the medical school, in the School of Public Health. Uh, uh, they're working with, with scientists and engineers from other, other departments as well. There are a number of folks in the psychology department that look at uh, how people learn to look at disparities in learning but based on gender and, and cultural background, et cetera. And in particular, look at learning styles in STEM, which is particularly relevant to what we're all about. I think as brain research becomes more and more uh, important for all sorts of different reasons, I think that we'll find that having the, that one of the best things that ever happened at the School of Science and Engineering was when the psychology faculty voted to to become part of our school. Uh, does Tulane track graduating, cla graduating classes GRE scores? If so, are they improving? Um, I don't know that we track GRE scores. We do, of course, carefully track where our students go to graduate school because a lot of our students go to graduate school. Uh, so we, that's something we keep track of. Uh, our students go to the very best graduate schools in the country and they do extremely well. And this is one thing that whenever we've gone through accreditation visits, it's been a metric that we've been very, very proud of, has been the success rate of our students uh, in graduate school. And in medical school, and law school, and business school, for that matter. I think we, we prepare our students very, very well for graduate and professional 
education. Uh, okay, well this, this question, okay, so this question is not for me, but I'll answer it and I'll address it anyway. Uh, do you anticipate developing an undergraduate social work degree or offering more classes geared to admission and advanced standing in a Master of Social Work program? So um, there is a school of social work at Tulane. That's one of the nine schools. And the dean is Ron Marks. He's the dean of the School of Social Work. So uh, really, uh, whoever asked that question, that would be the appropriate person to address that question to. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the School of Social Work does not plan on introducing an undergraduate degree, but I'll let Ron handle that one. Okay, here, okay, well this one, I expected this one. Why was the engineering school closed? And what are the plans for the future? Okay, so uh, to go back to the renewal plan. There were five departments in the School of Engineering prior to Hurricane Katrina. Um, Three of those departments, frankly, were very small, considering what those departments were, were expected to do. The Department of Civil Engineering, the Department of Mechanical Engineering, and the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Uh, all three of these departments had, I think Civil Engineering had, had eight faculty members. Uh, mechanical Engineering may have had 12. Electrical Engineering and Computer Science maybe 15 or 16, something of that nature. Those are very, very small numbers. Uh, while one can compete in biomedical engineering or chemical engineering with, with uh, 15 faculty members, it's really quite impossible to compete against the schools that I listed earlier in, in areas like civil, mechanical, and electrical with faculty uh, sizes of that, of that, of that, of that, of that, of that size. Um, the programs we had, I think, were quite good. But if you looked at the overall performance of the department in terms of undergraduate students plus research productivity plus doctoral education, they just didn't have the numbers to be able to compete in, a, in, in the arena in which Tulane University competes. Uh, we were trying to build those departments before Hurricane Katrina. When the storm hit, uh, we, there simply were, we, we didn't have the resources really to do a proper job of it before Katrina. When the storm hit, the resources clearly were not there. And so the university made a strategic decision to, to keep the two departments for which the, the size was adequate and the programs were excelling, to keep those, to couple it with the sciences, to build engineering in the future, but to build it in ways which could be more competitive. Um, and those departments were, were eliminated uh, after the storm. Uh, yes, next question. What are the prospects of returning the civil, electrical, and mechanical engineering degree programs to SSC? So we are building engineering within the School of Science and Engineering. That is something to which I am committed and to which we are committed. And for those of you who have heard uh, President Fitz at the town hall uh, the other day, uh, Tulane University is committed to building uh, engineering programs. Uh, the engineering physics program, it's our first program that we've introduced since Katrina, and computer science is back. Uh, the engineering physics program is focused on new materials. Uh, it's focused on electronic materials, uh, electromechanical devices, etc. I see us hiring a lot of faculty members going forward to supplement that program who would be electrical engineers and mechanical engineers, uh, undoubtedly. Uh, we've hired a couple faculty members who are electrical engineers. So, uh, so I see electrical engineering and mechanical engineering coming back within the context of our engineering physics program and our material science and engineering program. Whether we ever have programs that are called mechanical and electrical will of course depend on the numbers and how, 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 uh, how we can go about building programs that are competitive, but certainly that would be the place where that kind of activity is growing. Computer science we brought back as a department. And uh, that program will continue to grow. Uh, the one area where it's a little less clear is civil. Um, civil engineering, in order to have a, a, a competitive civil engineering department that has a, a accredited civil engineering program, it takes a lot of facets. Uh, civil engineering accreditation is very complex. And uh, we have to build an, an incredible capacity there. So we've taken enormous resources to do that. I certainly see the engineering physics program 
and the material science and engineering program is focusing on all sorts of materials, including structural materials, including smart, smart, smart structures, um, smart infrastructures, so there will be civil engineering applications there. Um, I think also with the, with the introduction of a new engineering program at the interface of the geosciences and engineering, that this will also be something which, which would be of much interest to, to civil engineers, where we would be hiring some civil engineers to participate in that program. So I see us growing both the, the structural side of things and the geo side of things, uh, but whether that ever uh, evolved into a, a civil engineering program, I don't see that happening certainly in the, in the near future. Uh, whatever we do is going to require resources, and that's going to be our biggest challenge, is getting the resources we need to build these programs, keeping in mind that we want to do it right. We want these programs to be programs we're proud of and programs that are, that are very competitive. Uh, the next question, when will computer science as a standalone degree be, be brought back? Okay, so it's another very good question. So where we stand with computer science? We now have a Department of Computer Science. The Department of Computer Science is physically located in Stanley Thomas Hall. Um, we have uh, Mike Mislov, a, a mathematics professor, uh, is the initial, the inaugural uh, chair of that department. Mike has done an excellent job in getting that department off the ground. And we've hired four faculty members at this point who have joined in that department. We're doing multiple searches right now. And we would like to get that department up to, to 10, 15 faculty members in short order. Uh, the faculty members that we've hired, uh, uh, three of the four are very research active. We've hired one professor of the practice so far. Uh, the searches that we are doing are for research active faculty members. We want that department to be competitive not only as an outstanding program, academic program, but comp competitive in research as well. When you bring in faculty members who are research active, they bring with them doctoral students. And they, they expect a doctoral program in which uh, their students can enroll. So the next priority in computer science is going to be a doctoral program. So uh, once we get the doctoral, and program, doctoral program in place, we will then revisit the undergraduate program. Uh, the coordinate major is actually a very appealing major. I've, I've been getting a lot of attention because modern computer science is very much uh, a discipline tied to applications. Uh, most students who go into computer science are not only interested in computer science for its own sake, they're also interested in how they can apply computer science to, uh, to biology to engineering, to art, to uh, public health, to business. Uh, if you look at the students who have enrolled in our coordinate major, they're from across the entire university. A lot of science engineering students, a lot of business students, a lot of liberal arts students, pu public health students. So I want, to, I want to see how that particular program evolves. I think it's going to be extremely popular. Um, we will revisit whether or not to introduce a standalone computer science undergraduate program uh, once we've had a chance to assess the coordinate major and have had a chance to put the PhD program into place as well. So the next question, which is, do you have plans to increase PhD programs? Right now we're looking at two new PhD programs. One of those would be in computer science, and the other, I believe, I mentioned earlier in the context of another question would be an interdisciplinary program in material science and engineering. I think that the two, two areas that cut across everything we do and, and everything that is, is being done in, 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 in engineering and technology uh, are computing and materials. So we're, we want to, and, and we're very strong here at Tulane in material science and engineering, that, that's for certain. And we're strong in computational science. And we're building a strong computer science department. And we intend to build um, our, our faculty in statistics. And so uh, in the PhD program in computer science, the PhD program in material science and engineering would be our next two priorities at, at that level. Uh, the next question, how successful is the engineering physics program? Uh, every indication is the engineering physics program is going to be very, very successful. Uh, we just started this program a few years ago. 
we had our first real graduating class two years ago, and we immediately went for ABET accreditation the very first year after our first graduating class. As I said, we've got ABET accreditation for, for the full six-year cycle uh, through 2020, so the program has been vetted by ABET and came out with flying colors. Uh, the students in the program are very, very good. Uh, I can attest to that. I currently teach a class to juniors in engineering physics, and uh, they're extremely good. Uh, they're one of the best students at Tulane, I can, I can tell you that. Uh, the students in that program, I've been, I've been tracking where they go after they graduate, and it's interesting. So far, about half of them have gone into industry, and about half of them have gone on to graduate school. The half that have gone into industry have gotten jobs at, at, at companies ranging from General Motors uh, to Blade Dynamics here in New Orleans East. Uh, all of them at high quality, high quality jobs at, at uh, very established companies. The other half have gone on to graduate school. And interestingly enough, while one or two of them have gone on to graduate school in materials engineering, uh, most of them have gone on to graduate school in civil, mechanical, or electrical at major universities around the country. And I've been, I've been in touch with them, and they're all doing, doing extremely well. So the engineering physics program is, is so far so good. I anticipate the enrollment to continue to grow and for that to become a program 20 to 30 student graduates per year, which is about, about what we're looking for for that program. I should mention, by the way, that there's another option that students have here at Tulane. They can major in physics and do a 3-2 program with Vanderbilt or Johns Hopkins. And the way that works is that they can uh, go five years, three years at Tulane and two years at the partner institution. And at the end of the five years, they will get a Bachelor of Science degree in physics from Tulane and a Bachelor of Science and Engineering degree in civil, mechanical, or electrical, or environmental from one of the partner institutions. Uh, very few students, some students have, have, have taken that track, but, but very few students have. Most of them who have started off in that track have opted instead to get the degree in engineering physics at Tulane so they can graduate in four years here with their, with their uh, classmates and then go to graduate school and get a master's degree in civil, mechanical, or electrical. And that appears to be uh, working extremely well for them. Uh, will there be a course in cybersecurity? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I think that the, the Department of Computer Science is evolving. Um, I think there's a, there's a plan that's been put together by the, the strategic plan that's been put together by the Department of Computer Science. The faculty members that they have hired so far, and they will continue to hire, are faculty members with kind of a dual interest. So they, all of them have a, a computer science area in which they, uh, they focus, uh, whether that be artificial intelligence or machine learning or systems or whatever, and an applications area that they have a great deal of interest and involvement in. And so that's, that's helped to build our, our, our core, uh, our, our um, coordinate major, and it's also helped to make the department very interdisciplinary. So I would, wouldn't be surprised if cybersecurity is not uh, an area that uh, that department um, will, will venture into at some point. Uh, one thing I did not mention in answer to all of these questions, I kind of emphasized the undergraduate education piece and the doctoral education piece, um, we have been developing a number of master's degrees. And what, the way we've been handling education at the master's level is to target specific areas for which there is a market and for which we can charge a, uh, a competitive tuition rate and offer a master's degree in a one and a half year to two year uh, time frame. And so I can see a offering more and more of these master's degrees in the future. Uh, cybersecurity might end up being, being one of those. Um, I know that there's been talk now, perhaps one in petroleum engineering. So, um, so we will be looking at targeted master's degrees. And if there's a market need for it and we have the expertise and we can, we can supply it at a competitive tuition rate, uh, we will be doing that. Uh, does physics Postgrad include astro engineering, uh, so we don't have we don't have uh, aeronautical uh, or aerospace engineering at Tulane. That happens to be my area. I have my bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees in aerospace engineering. Uh, but aerospace engineering is not something 
that Tulane has ever offered, uh, nor do I anticipate us offering aerospace engineering. A lot of our students don't do go into the aerospace industry um, because the background we provide them, whether it, it be on the uh, elect electrical side of things, mechanical side of things, or whatever, uh, does prepare them well for careers in in aerospace. And uh, I've become the, uh, the the advisor of choice for students who are interested in aerospace engineering because of my background. And I'm more than happy to help them, guide them through the courses that we do offer, and guide them into internships that they can find in the aerospace industry. Um, what opportunities are there for undergraduates to participate in research? So that is an important feature of the School of Science and Engineering. Uh, the students that come to Tulane, a very large percentage of them, uh, they know they're coming to a research university. They've come to a research university intentionally, and they're looking for research opportunities as undergraduates, not just as graduate students. So we try very, very hard to place as many of our undergraduate students into research opportunities as, 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 as want to go into research opportunities, and as many as we can. As I said earlier, I, uh, over 250 of our undergraduate students are currently working on research projects. Um, we've had a pretty easy opportunity, a pretty, a pretty, it's been, it's been relatively easy for us to find opportunities for students in some disciplines, and in fact, some of the disciplines actually require the students to do a research project as part of their curriculum. In the biological sciences, it has been more difficult, uh, simply because we have so many students in the biological sciences. And we have, it, it's by, if you look at uh, cell molecular biology, biomedical engineering, neuroscience, and psychology. So in the health sciences, we, these are some of our largest majors, and a lot of those students are seeking research opportunities. And in the past, we've had some difficulty accommodating all of them. Uh, we have recently built a very strong relationship, well, we've been building a very strong relationship with the health sciences downtown, and as part of that relationship that we've built with the health sciences downtown, more and more of our undergraduate students are being accommodated in research opportunities in the School of Medicine and the School of Tro Tro uh, Public Health and Tropical Medicine, and that's helped significantly. So we will do everything in our power to provide research opportunities for every one of our undergraduate students. Uh, that wants to pursue such a, a research opportunity. Uh, those research opportunities are part of their curriculum in many cases, or summer opportunities. Those are all arranged between the research, the faculty member doing the research and the student. Uh, internship opportunities. So the next question is about internship opportunities. Uh, what internship opportunities are available for students? Uh, we again have put a tremendous in, uh, uh, emphasis on internships. Uh, we believe that internships are a very, very important part of the student's education. Some of our majors require internships, and the ones that require internships, of course, have the, uh, the expectation that the students will be paired with uh, a company uh, to, in order to, to do that summer internship. Um, we have our, our Career Services Center is very active in identifying in internship opportunities for our students. And we as a school have been very active in identifying internship opportunities for our students. So this is something we put a lot of effort into. A very large number of our students do summer internships. Um, the engineering students you know, all do. And many, many of the science students do as well. So that, I think internships, research experiences, study abroad, these are all very important aspects of a modern education in, in the STEM fields. What opportunities are there for middle and high school students? Yes, as I said earlier, we've gotten very, very involved in K-12 STEM education. Um, if you look at the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, a lot of students who go into STEM at colleges, at, at Tulane and elsewhere, don't persist in STEM. Uh, we do pretty well here. Our, our, our retention rate is quite high. But around the country, uh, universities are reporting very low retention rates of STEM students. And so the question that one, that, that one has to ask is, why are students that are going into STEM fields um, not, not persisting in those fields, transferring into 
business, liberal arts, or whatever. If you ask students why they left a STEM field, you always get one of two answers. They will either say it was too difficult, or they will say it's not what I thought it was going to be. Now, if their answer is it was too difficult, they were ill-prepared. And if their answer is it's not what I thought it was going to be, they were misinformed. And so I think that universities, all universities, not just Tulane, uh, have the obligation to go into our middle schools and our high schools and help young people and teachers understand what STEM fields are so that students are well informed of what they're going into and what is required to be successful in STEM disciplines so, so that students are well prepared. Uh, a question which nags me far more than the other two questions is, if students were leaving the STEM field, if, if, if half of them are saying, it's not what I thought it was going to be, I, I think that's fine. If, they, if, if a student goes into a STEM field and finds that it's not what they thought it was going to be, they should leave it. They should go into another field. What concerns me is how many students should have gone into a STEM field who didn't because they didn't know what it, what it was. So I think it's very important, and I think this starts right in the middle schools. I think it's very important for us to, uh, to be involved as a university in K-12 STEM education. So that end, we have a K-12 STEM office out of the dean's office, and we are involved in a wide range of activities. If you go to our website, you can see what those activities are. Um, I anticipate that down the road, in the very near future, uh, there will be AP course uh, credit uh, courses in high school in engineering, which will be added to the AP courses in science and the AP course courses in computer science. And I think that universities like us need to be on the ground level here in training folks to teach those AP courses and informing what the content of those AP courses are. So we have many course, many programs here at Tulane University. Uh, we bring high school students and middle school students to campus for many of these programs, and I anticipate we'll be adding many more of these programs uh, going forward. So uh, that was the last of the questions for today. Thank you. That was that was a lot. I hope I, uh, I've answered them all to your satisfaction. If uh, you think of something afterwards, you can always send me an email. I'm, I'm always happy to answer my email. And um, any other questions, if you want to hold off on them, I anticipate we'll have another webinar, maybe in a, in a few months, and maybe do these on a regular basis to keep everyone engaged. Thank you again. And uh, I look forward to your questions and look forward to the next webinar.